I always knew my family was involved in some strange things. We never celebrated Christmas, Easter, or even Festivus. No, our main holiday was the Overtide, on the first full moon after the summer solstice. As my parents constantly drilled into my head, we were Reapeners, the few remaining mystics of an ancient path. The Reapeners devoted their lives to travel. We explored other worlds, other universes even. Many of us died in the way, or sometimes, travelers from our spiritual path would come back totally insane and rambling. Some had even clawed their own eyes out, as if trying to stop the horrors that they were seeing. My father had no real power in the Reapeners, but he was one of the most accomplished travelers in the world. The young male children of the leaders would often accompany my father out to the woods and to ancient cave systems near our house, where he would show them unimaginable things. One of the young trainees, a brash young man who couldn't have been older than 17, came back with totally white hair after a single night in the caves with my father. When I asked my dad what had happened, he simply gave me a sly smile and walked away. On my own 17th birthday, which took place a few years ago, I was to follow my father out into the forest before sunset. We would be heading to Hollowhead Cave, a 10 mile hike from the parking area. My father found the dirt road, pulling over on a slight turnaround. The nearest neighbor was miles down the road. We took no cell phones or supplies with us. We didn't have so much as a knife. We had been hiking for hours. I could feel blisters starting to form on my feet, and trickles of sweat rolled down from my hairline. The insects buzzed and chirped in the ferns and trees surrounding us and a cloud of gnats followed us everywhere we went. There was a slight smell of flowers in the air mixed with pines. Other than the insects, it was a beautiful and peaceful forest. Finally, my father broke the long silence. Are you scared? My father asked. I looked over at him. His strange, gray eyes were watching me, studying me. They seemed to snap and sizzle with inner energy. My father looked younger than his age, sturdy and well-built. Muscles grown over a lifetime of work filled out his clothes. Even though he was in his fifties, he had almost no wrinkles on his face and a few white hairs. Those are eyes that have seen beyond, I thought to myself. Those are eyes that have seen other worlds. The light that seems to shine from them must be holy. It must be the light of a thousand other universes. Does traveling really bring enlightenment, Pa? I said. He shrugged, looking forward again. It may or it may not. Enlightenment is already here at every moment, just like the same deathless mind is always present in every universe, or the same eternal soul is present in all the seconds of your life. Traveling to other spaces may help you see how this eternal consciousness is the same in every universe, how that endless mind stretches everywhere. It is more of a deepening awareness that you get from travel, one that brings enough wisdom to see the eternal as already here. But you didn't answer my question, my father said. Yes, I am afraid. It was nearly dark when we got to the cave. My father had been quiet most of the way. Now as he knelt in front of me, I saw what looked like a hand mirror in his back pocket, rolled up in cloth. What's that in your pocket? I asked. I always hold the black mirror, he said. We use it for training the young, opening up to the idea of traveling showing them a little of what is out there waiting for those with courage on their side. The cave was cool and refreshing. The torches had been put out along the walls, though I don't know when they were lit. I heard what sounded like a babbling stream echoing up through the rocky chambers, 
and I smelled far-off water mixing with the smoke of the torches. What about the red mirror? I whispered. I had heard rumors about it, but they were vague and contradictory. The red mirror. We don't generally speak of it. The high priest, Arkovich, personally attends to it most of the year. He tries to make it sleep. He tells me that prayer and meditation seem to soothe it, but sometimes it wakes up. I'll tell you a story while we walk. It'll make the uh, time pass faster. His voice seemed to crack slightly at this. His face looked grimmer and thinner in the flickering light. He looked at me with his strange gray eyes and in them. I saw the traveler that my father truly was. He had an iron core that was so fearless it almost seemed mad. He gave a nearly inaudible sigh and then he started the story. The high priest Arkovich was given the three mirrors in a somewhat strange way. He was on a meditative retreat, sleeping outside and drinking from the streams, eating ferns and mushrooms and whatever else he could scrounge. After the first day, he woke up to a pile of dead squirrels next to his head. Their necks were all snapped and they were stacked in a little pyramid. The second night, he tried to stay up, but after hours of standing guard, he lost the battle. He says that he fell asleep with his back against a tree. When he awoke, he found a pile of hundreds of shoes surrounding him. He says that when he left the spot to forage or drink, these piles were taken away in the blink of an eye. It was as if they hadn't been there at all, and there was no sign of anyone in the forest. He was out about a dozen miles from the road, far down a whining deer trail. He wasn't going to be spooked by these childish pranks, he told me. So he stayed another night. This time, he awoke to find a black box next to him. He opened it, expecting an animal's head or some other rubbish, but instead, he found these three strange mirrors. He touched them all in turn, the white, the red, and the black, and then he pulled them out. He looked into the red. The flat, polished stone on both sides sure made a poor mirror, he told me. In fact, all three of them were almost totally useless. They were clearly hand mirrors, of that he was certain. But who would put just a slightly reflective stone inscribed with strange ruins in place of the actual mirror glass? And then his mind made a connection. He had heard of shamans doing similar things to this making special hand mirrors for rites involving psychedelic drugs or mystical experiences, such as the shamans in Africa with their iboga vine. As he looked into it, though, he said the strange ruins seemed to start glowing. They sent out red light that pierced straight into his head. He said that he tried closing his eyes, but even with them fully shut, all he could see was swirling tunnels of red light. And then he was gone. When we travel, son, you know that we hear the ringing. Anytime you cross universes, all you can hear is that incessant, high-pitched sound which seems to vibrate your teeth and make your eyes water. I nodded. I had done some astral projection and lucid dreaming, both of which were considered vastly inferior by the Reapineers, like toys for children to play with. The most advanced in our religion always traveled bodily. It was considered the way to liberation. Enlightenment itself was the goal and seeing the true nature of all things by travel was the principal path. But some of the older members of our religion had told me that it was also terrifying, especially since anybody who traveled bodily could die if something in these strange alien worlds attacked them. Markovich says the ringing was the most intense that he had ever heard. He said that he thought his head would split open. The red light still blinded him, but he felt himself floating. And then he felt the light receding and opened his eyes. The ringing in his ears had gradually faded as he looked around, realizing that he was in a strange jungle, still holding the red mirror in one hand. But the ruins had stopped glowing and faded back into the stone, and the mirror again just looked like a useless decoration. 
He says the trees of the jungle stretched hundreds of feet above him with slippery yellow trunks and thin branches periodically reaching out. Ferns taller than a man surrounded him. He could barely see over the thick vegetation. There were no cries of birds, no insects, no animals of any kind that he could see. And then he heard a rustling, just a slight movement. Turning, he saw a blood-red shape duck into the ferns. Arkovich began to run. He ran for his life. He didn't know what kind of world he was in, but he knew when he was being stalked. He heard more of those things and saw glimpses of that bright red hide they had, and then one jumped directly in front of them. It stood over ten feet tall, with dozens of black eyes on stalks rising from the top of its thin oval head. Its legs were sleek and reptilian, like the legs of a velociraptor and long arms with knife-like claws at the end. It opened its mouth wide, showing rows of parallel serrated teeth, and from a bulging orange sack in the back of its throat, it spit at him. Sticky white webs shot out and wrapped around his legs before he even knew what was happening. And then he heard dozens more of those things closing in on him from all around ready to begin shredding his body. These were clearly the apex predators. He was stupid for not realizing why there were no animal sounds now. Likely, the life in the area had gone silent and moved on when they realized a herd of those things were in the area. As the nearest one bent down, hissing, silver streams of saliva running down its pointed chin, Arkovich picked up the red mirror. Instinctively, he traced his finger along the ruins, hoping for any sign of life from it. At once, it lit up, blinding him with a red light and he felt himself floating again, the ringing in his ears. He awoke at his house, nearly 20 miles away from where he had started just minutes earlier, still wrapped in webs. My father stopped in front of me. He had just come to a sharp turn in the cave, the rocks jutting out on both sides and making it thin and claustrophobic. I had to turn my body to slide through. I saw my father having more trouble with his larger frame but eventually he pushed himself through, sweating and slightly scraped up. Wow, I said, where do you think he went? My father shrugged. Son, the mirrors can send you anywhere at any time but... The red mirror in particular tends to send travelers to the worst places, where predators or demons are waiting. Other times, people have found themselves on nearly dead planets where strange robed beings have floated in the mist. Arkovich's son used the red mirror and he never came back at all. The mirror just showed up back in Arkovich's office, after his son had been missing for three days. We don't know where they went and we don't want more people being lost in such a way. And now we are here, my father finished saying. I looked around, frowning. It looked like just another part of the cave to me. And then I realized that I did see something. Out of the corner of my eye, one of the walls of the cave, it seemed to shimmer and glow. Even when I got close to it and touched it, it felt warm too much warmer than the other stone walls of the cave. It was only the space about the size of a door. Yes, my son, my father said. That is the gateway where we will send you through. Your test of manhood will be to see where the black mirror takes you. If the red mirror took Arkovich without any door, why do we need this one? I asked. My father leaned in close so that you don't come back 20 miles away at the bottom of a lake or 2,000 miles away at the bottom of some volcano, he said. My heart was beating fast and my stomach had started to hurt. I was having second thoughts. Okay, let's do this, I said. Let's see where the mirror takes me. He nodded and took out these supplies for the ritual. With a prayer to the eternal mind, he handed me the mirror. It felt much heavier than it looked. Moreover, it was as cold as death. As soon as I had touched it, the ruins lit up, blinding me. Pure white light shot out of them and the shimmering of the doorway was so intense now that I saw sparks and electricity. And then the wall opened. 
Every hair was standing up as I watched it happen, as if I were underneath a forming lightning bolt. All I could hear was buzzing. Holding the mirror tightly, I walked forward, through the doorway. Instantly, everything went black and the buzzing and electricity had stopped. I opened my eyes in a strange place. The sun was warm and the wind blew so fiercely that during the strongest of gusts, I stumbled and feared that I may lose my footing. Looking around, I saw mountains with irons and other metals peeking out, forming sharp, irregular blocks at the bottom. The tops disappeared under thick, stratified yellow clouds that blocked out the sky. Even the sky here was more than a hazy, orange silhouette in the impenetrable cold layer. I looked around, unsure of where to go. I could barely see any signs of life on this planet, besides some strange brown moss growing on the base of the mountains. I couldn't ask my dad or the mirror for help, but then I heard something. At first, I thought it was part of the wind, but I quickly realized that it sounded more like gurgling and screaming. I realized with horror that it was in English. Help! The voice said, Please, for the love of God, help me back before it comes. I followed the voice around some rocks standing nearly 20 feet high and found a man on the ground, bloody and missing a leg. He raised his head at my appearance and I realized that I knew who this was. It was High Priest Arkovich's son, the one that had gone missing a while back. It was almost hard to recognize him with stringy hair. Blood scraped skin and nearly all his clothes were torn or missing, but I could still see it in the eyes and construction of the face. It's okay, I said, leaning down. I'll get you out, it's going to be okay. No, he said. It's coming back, we have to go now. He looked behind me and his eyes widened. Oh god, it's too late. Without any weapon or even an idea of where I was, I turned to look at what nightmares this world held. The same ones that presumably had torn off or even eaten this poor man's leg. As soon as I saw it, I began to scream. At first, what appeared like the shadow of a huge hand stretched across the lifeless, hard-packed dirt of the strange planet. But this place may have had more life than I realized. With a cry, I realized that what looked like a black hand was just the shadow of the skittering, massive spider-like being that approached us in a blur. I turned back to Arkovich's son, whose name now came to me, Alaric, Alaric Arkovich. Oh God, get me out of here, Alaric screamed, his voice booming and echoing through the canyon. The massive mandibles of the spider creature flicked open and closed faster and faster, as if it could already taste the delicious, soft flesh of the injured man lying prone on the ground. Without thinking, I grabbed his outstretched hand and tried to drag him away from the beast, but I had no real hope of outrunning this monstrosity. It towered at at least 20 feet in the air and looked to have a dozen sharp, branching legs each stabbing into the hard dust with every forward step that it took. I grabbed the black mirror out of my pocket, screaming into it. Even though I was young at the time, I wasn't stupid and my instincts were still sharp. Please, I ask you, God, the over, the one who sees, take me out of here, I said, trying to look into the center of the hypnotizing electrical current that ran across the surface of the smooth and glassy mirror. At first, nothing happened and my heart began to race. The same thought ran across my mind over and over. I'm going to die out here. I'm going to die here in some strange world. The mirror has undoubtedly failed me. It sees my desperation and mocks me. But no, that was the red mirror the one who had led Arkovich's son to his mutilation, and perhaps had abandoned him. Was it only a fluke that I had come to this place, to what looked like an alternate earth, a strange desert plain with massive insectoid monstrosities, was not my idea of a vacation. And then the mirror began to change. 
Ruins that had been invisible only moments before now began to light up. I ran as fast as I could while dragging the still living man. I could only pray the mirror would be quick. I felt a strange vibration from Alaric's hand that I grasped. It felt like shaking or trembling, quick desperate pulls in different directions, but my attention never wavered. Within moments, the mirror had sent me traveling. My vision went white and my ears rang, as always happens when we pass between worlds. A sense of exhilaration and pride filled my heart. I had done it. I had saved Arkovich's son. I phased back into being in the Hollowhead Cave, where my father awaited. His face looked stoic and blank, his eyes totally flat as he stared around at the stone. For a moment it seemed that he didn't see me at all. Father, I cried, I'm back and you won't believe it. Arkovich's son, Alaric, I saw him and I got him back. I had a sudden surge of energy, but then the whining of the light-filled doorway in the cave seemed to pierce deep into my brain. I almost felt like I would faint. I took a few deep, slow breaths and sat down on the floor, still holding tight to Alaric's hand. My father looked down at me, his face pale, his mouth open in a silent expression of horror. I looked behind me expecting to see Alaric's unconscious body, but instead I realized that I only held a dismembered arm, a sharp point of a bone sticking out of the bloody limb. And then I did faint and everything went black. I woke up to a feeling of cold, clean water in my tongue. Someone held a tin cup to my mouth, elevating my head and trying to pour water from what seemed like a local stream into my mouth. It instantly refreshed me and my eyes flew open. Thank God I was no longer holding the limb of the dead man. Well, I guess we know what happened to Alaric, my father said. He must have used the red mirror. I would guess the mirror returned without him, abandoning him in some horrible place. Maybe at night when the demons of that place are most active. It wouldn't be the first time the Red Mirror has acted with such treachery. It cannot leave you if you keep it directly on your person at all times. But if you fall while running and it goes flying, he shrugged, it can decide to return home to Earth Prime. That was the Reaperner name for the regular Earth, the one where people built cities in the year was 2023 AD, the starting point for all Reaperner travel as far as I knew, unless Reapeners existed on other worlds or had started to convert some of the strange otherworldly creatures that they encountered to our secret path. I don't know about those other worlds, but this looked like an endless desert with huge, rabid insects. The monster must have been the size of a small elephant, and faster than any animal I had seen in my entire life, I said. Merle Arkovich isn't going to respond well to the news, he said. I know he has in his heart still some hope that his son will return, perhaps with wild stories of other universes, but we must go straight to him and let him know. What he does from there is up to him. And so we did hike back to the car mostly in silence. I was deep in thought reflecting on my first terrific experience traveling. I had heard stories from the older Reapineers about worlds that they had seen. There were endless universes, endless worlds, and many alternate Earths, some covered in water, others covered in endless deserts, others circling dead stars or black holes in the cold blackness of space. A few also talked about heaven worlds that they had seen, where beings fed on pure bliss and light where rockets took these strange inhabitants to other galaxies in a matter of moments and death and disease had been nearly vanquished by the forward march of technology. They talked about beautiful cities floating in the clouds with silver spires miles high and elevators that took one outside the atmosphere of the planet to look at the beauty of space without any interference or air to distort the infinite stars. 
These thoughts passed through my head as we walked in the forest. The smell of pines and flowers clearing my anxiety and bringing me back to the present. Yes, my first trip had been horrific, but I had survived. And now perhaps my news would bring closure to the high priest, who would know what had happened to his son and be able to bury at least a small part of his body. An image flashed in my head. A tiny coffin, a few inches wide by nine inches long, with a decomposing arm inside of it. A sharp splinter of bone poking out through the torn flesh at the end. I shuddered. I had never liked Arkovich much. He made an imposing figure, standing well over six feet tall, his hypnotizing blue eyes staring out at the world, intelligent and determined. But the way that he spoke to people gave me and many others the impression that he thought less of us. No one would ever say it to his face, but he seemed in many ways arrogant and inflexible. However, he had also led the Arepaneers to a period of prosperity. We had received converts from Blackwater and other militias, as well as various converts who had immense wealth in the stock market or were involved in the running of a certain large tech companies. He used this to acquire weaponry, to form his own small army and to increase the power of our little island of spirituality in the world. When my father and I pulled up to his house and told him, at the door to his mansion what had transpired, his face grew stonier and angrier. He said not a word. As soon as we had finished, he turned away, saying brusquely, Stay right here, and then slammed the door. Neither my father nor I looked at each other or said a word. The tension in the air felt thick. After about ten minutes, Earl Arkovich came back to the door, looked at my father and me, and addressed us. James, he said to my father and then looked at me. And Tristan. Tristan, your very first travel ends up like this. He shook his head. I'm disappointed in you and both of you, to be honest. The hair rose on the back of my neck. What was he talking about? Reverend, my father said, but Earl raised a hand. Since when do we leave the bodies of our dead in our worlds to be eaten by abominations or fed on by demons? He said, his voice never rising above conversational level but instead allowing a deep underlying venom to imbue each word. I barely made it back alive. I said frantically unbelieving. Was this priest a madman? We never leave the bodies of our dead. Earl hissed. You two will return with me. Tristan knows the world. He can take us back there. I have called up a team to Hollowhead Cave. You will return with me right now. And so we did. And that's how I found myself back in Hollowhead Cave with a team of seven other men, including my father and Earl Arkovich, planning to go back into another world that very night. We waited for an old man, the most powerful one known for opening doors and traveling. He lived far out in the forest in a small shack, acting like a hermit much of the time and spending most of his time in nature. Yet when the Reapineers went to find him, he would always come and help. He would teach the younger ones about doorways and portals and try to pass on his wisdom as well. I was excited to see this figure, even though I didn't know so much as his name, but I had heard many stories about his power. While we waited, a large black Reapineer named Samuel, who Earl had recruited from Blackwater, began to sort through our weaponry. My eyes bulged as I saw them pull out rifles with detachable flashlights and telescopic laser sights, as well as many extra-loaded magazines and what I immediately recognized as grenades. They were the kind with the pineapple exterior to allow extra grip when throwing them. I counted seven rifles and maybe a few dozen grenades. It looked to be quite an arsenal. They started handing weaponry around and handed one to me. I took the gun in my hands, looking at its beautiful craftsmanship, feeling the butt of its extendable stock against my shoulder. I felt immediately more comforted by the presence of weapons, 
Even though deep in my mind, I wondered how effective any such weapons would be against creatures from another world. As my mind ran through the encounter with this huge, spider-like being, and hairs began to rise in my arms, the gun began to feel a lot smaller. At that moment, the old man walked in, reminding me of depictions of Merlin or Moses that I had seen. His huge white beard extended down nearly to his waist, and he held a solid ironwood staff, the strange wood shining back in the torchlight of the cave. He looked at the mass of us assembled there, seven ribboneers in all, all armed with semi-automatic rifles and strapped with multiple clips and grenades all around their chests. This is a tall order, Reverend, the old man said to Earl Arkovich, whose face it turned into a skull. You're the strongest traveler and most accomplished with doorways, old father, he said, his face still twisted into something ugly and unhappy. Do you say you cannot get us all through the door? I and getting one or two of you through the door before it slams closed is no issue. Seven or eight, however, this will push the talents of even the most accomplished Reaponeer. And you all have your baggage, your gunnos and exploding granados. I see. With this, he gave a casual flick of his face towards the heavy semi-automatic rifles and grenades strapped across our bodies. Every extra pound we must force through the door will make the chance of success less and less likely. Nevertheless, Arkovich said, it must be done. Are you not Mary Ope Winston, the greatest and most powerful living traveler? Open the door, I know you can do it. The old man had a petulant and almost childlike look of unhappiness on his bearded face, his huge hooked nose trembling slightly beneath his deep and brown eyes. But he sighed and nodded. It shall be done. The old man, whose name was apparently Miriope, responded. If God wills, if the overmind is with us and gives us the power. He will, Arkovich said simply taking the red mirror out of his cloak. We all stared in fascination and horror for a minute. The mirror seemed to have a consciousness of its own, one that could be felt in every part of the cave. It was as if a demon had just opened its eyes in the darkness, and yet it radiated a power that was unmistakable and pure. I felt the hairs rising on my arms and head accompanied by a humming sound like strong electrical power lines filling my ears. Put it away, Miriope cried, his eyes widening, his straight, very white teeth flashing as he opened his mouth in a silent scream. For the love of all gods, put it away into a ready. Would you use an atomic bomb simply to give some light in the darkness? Or slice off your face so you don't have to shave your beard? Don't treat the trinkets of the other world so lightly. The cave went silent. I only wish to bring peace to my son to recover his body and bring it back to us. Earl said quietly, lethally, like the hissing of a snake. Peace does not come out of the end of a gun, my priest, Mariope said, not in the least bit perturbed. It comes from the overmind. Only death comes out of the end of a gun. We all stopped, the cave going quiet except for faint breathing, and then the old man started up again. Who is the young man whose mind will reveal which world to us? Muriel asked. I stepped forward. He apprised me, looking me up and down slowly, as if searching for something that wasn't there. And then he sighed. Young man, you will be central to this opening. Your mind must mix with mine and we must use our combined power to focus on the doorway. You will be the last one through, so your job is ever more dangerous. When the door slams shut, it slams shut instantly. Travelers have been cut in half, I tell you truly. Why, one of my mates when I was a lad lost his right hand. Do you understand the gravity of what I have told you? I nodded. Then come by my side and let us begin. The night is drawing on and strange things may be seen in the night over there as well.
if it is night. I hope for your sake it isn't. With our guns and grenades now strapped onto our bodies with equipment Samuel had passed around and helped us fasten when necessary, we looked like a ragtag group of rebels. Many of the Reapineers wore the coarse brown robes common to our religion, giving them a medieval monkish appearance. Samuel did not, however. He wore brown desert fatigues and combat boots. Standing nearly six and a half feet tall, his black skin shining and his huge muscles bulging, he was an imposing presence, and I felt the desire to stand near him when any battles erupted. He radiated confidence and deadliness. Are we ready? Earl asked, low, a slight tremor in his voice. The rest nodded. Miriope grabbed my hand. What is your name, lad? He asked in a quiet voice. Tristan, I said. My father is James. I pointed to him. I care not for your father, lad. The old man said, not unkindly. It is you who will carry the task to the end. You are the strongest and purest, and the youngest as well. I will wait here until you return until I'm sure you will not. He grabbed my hand. Now begin to meditate on the world you saw. You will be returning there. Earl saw that we were assembled. He pulled out the red mirror, going in front of the doorway in the cave. The one that looked like solid stone, impassable. The humming began immediately, and the poisonous presence filled the cave. But I closed my eyes and I focused on the world. I felt someone else in my mind, and I realized with horror that it was the old man. Miriope had telepathic power somehow, and he saw my memories with me. I felt his hand twitch and what felt like a surge of electricity passed through our bodies, but it didn't hurt. Focus harder, Miriope said through gritted teeth. Focus on the door, focus on the world. Open the portal. I did, with thousands of images flashing through my mind, the way the sun had shone on the desert, the dead rocks, the many legs of the spider. I focus and sent this thought out front towards the door. It begins to open. Uro cried in a loud ecstatic voice, but I didn't open my eyes. Focus harder, Mariope said. We've almost got it. Sweating, straining, my eyes flicking back and forth under their lids, I concentrated. I put all of my energy into those thoughts on that door and then I felt something give. Behold, Miriope cried as he and I opened our eyes at the same time. The portal is opened. The men began to run through, scrambling into a dark desert world on the other side of the stone threshold. When the last one was through... Miriope pushed me towards the door. I was sprinting, seeing the door closing. With one last bit of energy, I jumped through as I felt it slam shut behind me. A whoosh of air ran over my skin as the stone slammed back into the wall. In those last moments, I was still connected to Miriope telepathically, and I heard his one thought over and over as I went through the door. Once it closed, it stopped. But I kept hearing it repeating in my head, and nonetheless. You think you go to a desert world? Nay, nah, lad. It is a Hades world, and it is night there. I will wait for you here, but it is a horrible place, and very few will return from such as that. And as I looked back, I saw Miriope's eyes. In the depth of his power, his eyes had widened and I saw his pupils contracting and expanding rapidly. His eyelids fluttered up and down as if he were seizing. Strength flowed out of him towards the door, a current that seemed to twist the air, like a rising heat wave from a desert. That was the last thing I saw from this world before the nightmare began. When we came through, it was chaos. The Red Mirror dumped us in the middle of the night in the worst possible place, as it is known to do. And as I came through, my ears had begun to ring and my vision went white. When traveling between worlds, these things nearly always happened, knocking one off balance for at least a few seconds, 
as if a flashbang had just been thrown in the area. But as my vision cleared and my hearing returned, I was relieved to see that this planet was Earth. I could tell that much from the constellations and the moon in the sky. Some other Earth, yes. Perhaps in a universe where life had grown strange and terrifying, but still some form of Earth. In front of us stood a desolate camp. It reminded me of death camps that I had seen footage of. Communist and National Socialist death camps where people were starved or frozen. Row after row of razor wire surrounded the camp, and a gate stood at the center. It had a sign above it, but it had seen so much sun and aging that the letters had faded to almost nothing. I saw no guards in the watchtower and nobody shot at us. The place radiated silence and death, but there was a smell that came from it, a smell like rot and crap and corpses. Around the camp I saw strands of webbing sticking to various fences and posts, covering the dilapidated barracks inside the camp that looked ready to collapse under the slightest breeze. Is this it? Earl asked from my side in a low voice. I looked around. The rocks looked similar, but I had only been in this world for a short time. And if the entire area looked like a rocky desert, what chance did I have of finding the exact same spot? I believe we may be close. The webbing for one. That must be the creature who took your son. Behind us, I heard people clicking off the safeties on their rifles. We began to walk towards the gate. I stayed by the side of my father and Samuel, letting Earl lead the way. As soon as we had entered, I heard a sound that sent shivers of horror through my body. It sounded like the breathing of a dying man with pneumonia, a raspy, gurgling breath that came from all around us, and that smell intensified immediately. The smell of death blew on the breeze towards us. When we had entered the camp, the gate swung shut behind us as if on its own accord. I turned jumping but saw no one there. And then they began to come out of the barracks. They were horrifying beyond words. Children in torn rags with rotten bodies. Long stringy black hair hung over their faces and on their striped uniforms. Blooms of dark red showed long dried blood. Brown streaks mixed with the blood in their eyes shone with hatred and malice as they approached from all sides. Hundreds of them gasped and shook. They reminded me of pictures that I had seen of children in Auschwitz. Their trembling, emaciated legs barely held up their weight. Their knees knocked together, the bones making a clicking sound. Some had their noses and cheeks eaten away by insects. Black swarms of flies surrounded them eating their flesh and laying eggs as they walked forward, all staring and rasping at us, the treat in the center of all. Shoot them, Samuel cried, the one man who had kept his head in the terror of the moment. For God's sake, do it. Would you have us all die? That broke the stillness, and with a deafening roar, the rifles began to open fire. Those in my group on the outside of the circle disappeared first into the crowd of rotting, grasping hands. The cyanotic blue fingernails of the demonic children in the camp had what looked like dried blood and dirt caked underneath. They bit and clawed like rabid animals. One reaper fell underneath a dozen of them. His face quickly turned into a mask of blood as they bit and ripped at his eyes, nose, and mouth. In his last fading moments of life, he pulled out the pin of a grenade and blew himself, and all of his remaining grenades sky high. The force of the explosion shook the ground and knocked me off balance. My ears rang as I tried to back up, but found the fence at my back. The enemy swarmed us in human wave attacks that quickly overwhelmed our positions. I fired as fast as I could, shooting into the ground at the head or chest of anything that moved outside my group. I know that I personally killed at least 20, seeing their heads explode from the impact through my scope, the attached flashlight giving everything an eerie, overly bright LED glow. I stopped to reload a fresh magazine, breathing hard. 
As I inhaled, I could smell the blood all around us. A rusty metallic odor that mixed with the scent of death and crap in the camp to create the most foul mixture. I wanted to vomit from the cloying mix, an odor that hung so heavy in the air that I swore I could actually taste it. But I sucked my saliva down, trying to focus on the battle around me. Things started to go wrong quickly. We had lost at least four men that I had seen, yet the waves of attack kept coming. I looked at my side to see Samuel sweating heavily, his eyes wide and wild, a huge grin on his face as he shot as fast as the semi-automatic weapon would allow, pulling the trigger violently over and over until the magazine ran dry. I heard the slight click when he tried to keep shooting the last time and realized that the chamber was empty. I looked forward and saw a potential path to a nearby barracks. Samuel! I screamed as loudly as I could. He looked over at me and I pointed to the barracks. We can get to that building if we stick together and shoot. Then we can try to pick them off one by one as they come in the door. He needed no more urging than that. He turned to my father and Earl Arkovich as they stood behind us a few feet apart, shooting and throwing grenades. I heard another explosion from nearby and then Samuel started bellowing, his voice deep carrying across the whole camp. James, he screamed to my father. Earl, we're going to try to make it to that building. He gesticulated wildly with his gun, pointing it at the building for emphasis. They nodded and we started running as one. Hands tried to grab at my clothes as the bleeding kids closed in around us. We had made it most of the way to the door by this point, and the way ahead still looked clearer. We opened fire on anything close that moved and my father and Earl each threw a grenade at a large mass that staggered and writhed towards us. With a satisfying explosion, I saw the heads of one after another fly off their bodies. But we were outnumbered in maybe 100 to 1, and no matter how fast we shot or how many grenades we threw, they kept closing in around us. I vowed to keep a grenade for myself in case I found myself surrounded and alone. I would not let myself be eaten alive. My skin ripped off or my eyes bitten out. I would blow myself up if it came to that and take as many of these abominations with me when I went. But we reached the door to the barracks, Samuel barreling into it without stopping, his massive frame splintering the rickety wood into a thousand small pieces that flew into the barracks. I sprinted in behind him and then my father and Earl, their feet pounding heavily on the bare dirt ground. I found myself in a pitch dark room, the only light coming from the flashlights attached to our guns. The room looked much larger on the inside than it did on the outside, and the light didn't even reach the far wall. We had no time to stop and clear the area, however, as the first enemies had already reached the threshold. My plan worked well. We all opened fire, piling bodies up at the door as fast as we could. After a couple dozen had fallen, Lane sprawled on the ground in their black and white striped uniforms. The rest piled up, pushing and trying to get through. Pools of red spread around the bodies of those we had shot, and those behind it slowed enough to the point where we could easily pick them off one by one. It's just like the Spartans in the Battle of Thermopylae, Samuel said. He looked over at me. They can't easily get through because of the narrow entrance, so it allows us to ambush and kill them in small groups, rather than taking on the whole mass of them. Kid, I think you saved our lives. I smiled over at him. By this point, so many bodies blocked the doorway that the ones behind couldn't possibly get through. The thin, twisted bodies piled up three or four high, all the way from directly inside the door of the barracks to ten feet beyond it. Of course, this also meant that we couldn't easily get out, and soon that became a problem. We checked the rest of the barracks for any signs of movement, traps, or creatures. It looked totally clear. In the back half of the barracks lay bunk after bunk, all made of cheap plywood. A single bunk had three levels and a person could slide into each and lay down. 
The space would not allow someone to raise their head, however. They would have to shimmy back out. The space above the first and second bed looked to be only about 18 inches tall. The person on top had no such issue since the top level was open. And behind these hundreds of bunks, I kept seeing shadows move. I cleared the area as fast as I could, but with only the flashlight and the gun for light, it still took a few minutes. And I gaped at how many beds lay here. They must have crammed all the kids together like sardines. Each bunk only had a space of an inch or two to the next. And I couldn't have even slept on such a narrow wooden platform unless I slept on my side. I saw no pillows, no blankets, and no sheets anywhere. I returned to my father and Earl, sighing. Samuel walked through the inside of the barracks, checking the walls for any holes or secret doors or anything else that could surprise us. He found nothing and then we were four again, standing in front of the pile of bodies. My father brought out some peanut butter crackers from his jacket, passing around a sealed, a snack-sized packet to each of us. I realized just how hungry I was when my hands had wrapped around it. Ripping it open, I started eating the peanut butters quickly. Earl Arkovich had bottles of water that he had secured in a small pack, and we each got one. Though to my disappointment, I saw they were these small half-bottles. I knew that I would finish that in a single swallow. We need a plan, Samuel said. A thousand yard stare in his eyes as he stared beyond the front wall of the barracks into something that only he could see in his mind. Yeah, my father said. This is a nightmare. We've already lost four men. Come on, James, Earl said to my father. We don't know for sure that all four have died. It's possible some got away. I saw those possessed or undead kids or whatever they are rip off one of their faces and eat it. I whispered. My voice carried in the darkness. I saw them eat his eyes. Yes, yes, it's very sad. Earl said in a calm, flat voice. But... Our plan needs to be that a couple men should cover the door while Earl brings out the red mirror. The other can help him in whatever way he needs. We need to evacuate as soon as possible, my father said. Earl's eyes looked like they might bug out of his head. We haven't even found my son's body yet, he said, his voice rising in anger and indignation. How can you possibly want to leave? That is utter cowardness. No, Samuel said, ripping his eyes away from that unknown point in the distance and looking straight at our high priest. No, he's right. We need to leave. The sooner the better. Earl looked around amazed as if he had expected to see hidden cameras in the room. And then he stood up as tall as he could, whacked his right fist on his chest and grinned. That grin did not look like his normal one. It made him look insane and unhinged. At that moment, I wondered how much his son's death had really affected him. I felt sure that his madness would lead us all to our doom, if we allowed it. We all sat in silence staring at each other for a moment when somebody grabbed my father from behind. It was so black that I hadn't noticed it approaching in the shadows behind him, as my attention had been focused on the high priest. But when my father had started shrieking and calling for help, we all raised our guns. One of the black spider creatures had gotten in somehow. This one looked much smaller than the one that I had seen kill Alaric Arkovich. It was no taller than a man, but it had the same dozen skittering legs, the same huge mandibles extending from its face, constantly tasting the air as they opened and closed in rapid succession. It used these mandibles sharp and long and curving to grab my father by his leg and drag him quickly away. The speed at which these small ones skittered was eerie. I instantly raised my gun to try to shoot, but it moved so fast that I had barely no time. I fired a single shot which went high, and then the spider had taken my father down a hidden tunnel on the back of the barracks, disappearing from view. No! I screamed. We have to go get him. The other two men still looked somewhat shocked. Earl's eyes had gone wide, while Samuel had shifted from leg to leg uncomfortably, 
running his huge hand over his shaved head repeatedly. The sweat poured down his face into my horror. I saw that he looked scared. The same man who had been a soldier and mercenary in countless war zones. He was scared. Yeah, yeah, you're right, Samuel said. Now we can't leave. God dang it. We should have left immediately as soon as we had blocked the door. This place is a death trap. He shot an angry glance at Earl Arkovich. Samuel looked like he wanted to strangle the man. Earl didn't even seem to notice. His eyes had glazed over and he seemed to stare at nothing. Let's do this, Samuel said, grabbing Earl by the shoulder and pulling him forward. We all started running. The hole in the ground didn't even look large enough for the spider to have gone through, though I assumed it could squeeze and morph its body into tight spaces, just like many insects on Earth. I wasn't surprised that nobody had seen the trap door. Dirt and filth absolutely covered every square inch of the floor of the barracks, and the seams of the wooden door fit perfectly into the rest of the floor. Underneath all that debris, nobody would have seen the seams anyway, even if we had far more light. The tunnel had been carved right out of the packed dirt. A man could walk through it if he crouched. Samuel might have trouble since he was extremely tall, but Earl and I wouldn't have much issue. I went first and started sprinting as fast as I could, hoping to catch up with my father. I heard the other two drop down in the dirt behind with a dull thud and the pounding of their steps. I didn't look back, but only focused on navigating the winding dirt tunnel. It seemed to go on forever. After about ten minutes of running, crouched down and carrying my gun and gear, I was tired. But I kept pushing myself, remembering the screaming face of my father. I kept hoping it wasn't too late. After fifteen minutes of running, the tunnel opened up into a cavern filled with rocks. I could stand up straight again. The ceiling extended twenty feet above me with filthy drops of water dripping down on my head and making the rocky floor slippery. I saw remnants of what looked like spider webs sticking to the walls, wispy and falling apart as if ancient. A few seconds later, Earl and Samuel emerged behind me. With the opening of the tunnel, we could walk side by side. If we had to start shooting, then moving in a line didn't seem wise. The cavern continued to open up, until my flashlight no longer illuminated the ceiling far above me. The floor stretched hundreds of feet to my left and right, with sharp, rocky projections standing straight up. Water continued to drip down the walls and fall from the ceiling, and we had to slow our pace so as to not slip on the slick and wet ground. I saw pieces of webbing sticking to the cliff-like walls and these looked much fresher. Most were just individual strands hanging down, as thick as an arm and stretching dozens of feet long. I knew what had made those and I dreaded having to meet them again. Up ahead, I heard shrieking and cries for help. I ran forward, seeing the silhouette of my father suspended in the air a couple of hundred feet away, held in place by the thick strands of sticky web hanging down from each crevice in the wall. It didn't form a traditional spider web, but rather just many interlaced strands hanging down dozens of feet. I saw lifeless bodies further ahead, totally wrapped from head to foot in the white strands. God help me, my father cried down to us. Where are they? Samuel yelled over to him. My father shook his head violently. I don't know, I don't know, just please help me. I looked up at him, realizing how difficult it would be to get him down. He hung over a dozen feet in the air, suspended with his arms out in a T reminding me of statues of Jesus on the crucifix. Samuel pulled gingerly at a thick strand of spider webbing that hung down in front of my father. Satisfied that it would hold his weight, he began shimmying up, wrapping his thick legs and arms around the strand until he was nearly face to face with my father. He pulled out a huge knife and began to cut the strands holding him in place. At that moment, I heard the skittering of hundreds of legs. Looking behind me, I saw Earl Arkovich crouched over a dark silhouette, wrapped in many layers of webbing. He began to cry and scream. It's a lark! 
It's Alaric, my son, my only son, he screamed, falling on his knees and hugging the body. He threw his gun to the side, weeping. I could see his mind had finally snapped. Samuel began to throw the last of his grenades at the dozens of approaching spider monsters. The first one blew the front three apart in a cataclysmic blast, sending legs and chitinous shells flying in all directions. I knew that we had to get to the Red Mirror and leave immediately. I ran over to Earl Arkovich, reaching into his robes. He didn't even seem to notice that I was there as I took the mirror from him. He still lay on the ground, kissing and hugging his son. Samuel was in the front and quickly became overwhelmed. Dozens of spiders poured in through every opening in the cave. As my father ran over to me and I drew the mirror up to my face, activating the silver ruins, I saw Samuel pull the pin on his final grenade, holding it to his chest as the mandibles of the giant creatures bit into his chest and neck. Spurts of red went out in all directions. As we were transported back to the door at Hollowhead Cave, I saw the silhouette of Samuel, grinning wildly as flames burst from his body and took the lives of a dozen of the spider creatures with them. Miriope ran over to us, checking us for injuries. I kept screaming over and over, They're all dead! God, they're all dead! And then I blacked out for a second time. In my dreams, I kept seeing Earl hugging his son's body, the grin of Samuel as he died, fighting and taking his enemies with him. I woke up in my bed, covered in sweat with enough nightmares to last me a lifetime. So in the end, Earl Arkovich got his desire. He ended up finding his son's body, and they may rest together forever, until some abomination from that world eats them. I suppose.